Hi, this is my Sega SC3000 personal computer. Now this is Sega's first personal computer uh, released in 1983 and I didn't even know this existed up until a friend sent me a Facebook marketplace listing for this particular unit broken and the seller was not sure why. So we uh, kind of both agreed that it wouldn't last long on Facebook marketplace at the price that he had it listed and well I ended up being the person to buy it. <laughs> so I guess we were correct. But uh, yeah, no, I really keen to get in on this. Uh, the seller had no idea what was wrong with it. He just said it gave a black screen when it turned on. Um, but yeah, so the only thing I'm going to need to do is figure out a power supply because this usually would come with a power supply of its own. But unfortunately, all it came with was a copy of Championship Boxing. Um, but it does use a nine volt center negative uh, power supply, the same as the Sega Master System, which is kind of sort of related to this system. Uh, but yeah, um, I reckon we just dive straight in. I think first and foremost what we'll do um, is let's just give it a test. So I know that these units, like I said, takes uh, 9 volts and a negative, so I've got my benchtop power supply ready to go. Let's make sure it's turned off. And the oh, AV is plugged into uh, my TV capture Majiga. Um, and the one thing with the SC3000 is I know it does not have an internal uh, ROM or an OS or anything, so if there's nothing in the cartridge slot, it will not do anything. But what I want to do is just turn it on without anything in anyway. Just check that we're getting that power switch. So, uh, 9 volts, yep, let's check the power. Okay, good power light. And as expected, yeah, nothing on the screen, so that's, that's good. Um, now, the other unfortunate thing is the basic cartridges. So, there was a, uh, literally a cartridge that just had basic on it. There were actually four of them I think. There were different levels that had different uh, amounts of RAM and different um, I think complexities of the basic included, um, but they're getting pretty rare and this did not come with one. In fact the, it only actually came with one game which was Championship Boxing. So let's give it a shot. Um, now I mean the seller flat out told me this didn't work so I'm not expecting much here but pop it in and flick it on. And nothing. Yep, as expected. Okay, so there are many commonalities with these, and one of them is these contacts can just be absolute trash, but also you might have noticed how much effort I had to put in, and you can hear that. Oh, it's quite a quite a snap. Um, and what that does is actually breaks the solder contacts for the cartridge port on the PCB, and they can often uh, be completely loose. But yeah, what I want to do first and foremost is just get a uh, cotton swab with some alcohol on it. Give this a wipe down. <laughs> I mean, hell, it might just be a dirty cartridge contact. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's nasty. <laughs> Well, let's give it a shot. Okay, power on. Still nothing. Okay, yeah. You never try. You never know until you try. So, next thing I'd like to do is I'll just grab some of my WD contact cleaner and give the cartridge port here a little, little. That should dry pretty quickly. And while that's still a little bit wet, pop the cartridge in. And hopefully that'll make a good contact. And then let's try again. Yep, no dice. Okay, no problem. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's dive in and see what we see. Okay then. All right. Well, let's start. I'm taking out this keyboard connector. So it's just two ribbons. These are just individual pins pressed in. So these are fairly fragile, but not as fragile as little ones but it is little bare metal wire pins so you don't want to you don't want to damage those pins 
Yeah, it looks pretty good, so I'm just going to pop that aside as well. And let's take a good look in here. I wonder if that's all that's needed. Click it on. Oh, we're getting video now. Nothing else. Hmm. Well, that's something. So I wonder why this was disconnected and what it actually even does. Huh. Thing over here. What are they? Um, standoffs. There we go. Oof. Oh, that is filthy. So where did that come from? Black wires up here. Red wires over there. Just got pin pickups here and there all over the board. I have no idea what this is for. Oh, this must be a video processor, maybe. Which explains why there's a 4.4. 33618 megahertz crystal there because that's the uh, that'd be our PAL frequency. That's the system crystal for the CPU. Got a this one here is 10.73863 megahertz. Hmm, what else have we got? Okay, so we've got our RAM down here. So this is our MB. 8118, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, some 74HCO4, what's that there? TMS9929ANL, there's our D8255AC, I'm not quite sure, there's some date code on there, there's 83. 4216, wouldn't that be an EPROM of some kind? I don't know. MN4216. Hmm. That looks like an EPROM of some kind. Could be a processing chip. That's a, that'd be our Z80 that runs this, the main CPU. So D, D780. Possibly. I don't know, I'm talking about my ass here. I'd have to look all of these up, so I am not sure. Immediate observations is that this is filthy. It's disgusting in here, so I'm going to want to take this board out and give it a good full clean out. Um, and one thing I've just noticed is the power switch here. I don't see how I'm going to get that out. I'm going to have to desolder that because if you look here closely, it's actually soldered directly to a couple of pins on the board. Um, and that's a press fit part, so you have to take that switch out that way. You can't press it further in. So I'm gonna have to desolder those pins in order to get that switch out. That's a bit um that's a bit how you going. But yeah, look at all this scunge and corrosion all over all of the pins. Down in there. Absolutely grotty. It looks like this was kind of like left in a flooded pool of water for a while. Maybe it was found outside. Hmm, oh yeah, there's our board number and a date code of 1983 on the on the PCB itself. Oops. So yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to tear into this, take this out, give it a full clean down, and then uh, we'll see what to do next. Probably trace, uh, I want to see what the connectors are underneath the cartridge port uh, and see if we're actually getting good good pin connections there. So I'm curious now, while I've got it out, because we are getting a video signal now, do we get a video signal without a cartridge installed? Maybe it's just not detecting that. We do, okay, so yeah, we get a black screen, same as when the cartridge is plugged in. So it's entirely possible. Let's just wiggle it around a bunch. I wonder if it's entirely possible that we're just not getting a good cartridge uh, connected there. And I mean, that was not connected to begin with, so. 
Hmm. Yeah. All right. I'm going to break this down and I'll be back when it's uh, better. Right. So I just got the rod out and flipped it over. It's disgusting. But also the first thing that I noticed is that the power jack and the uh, cartridge port have already been reflowed. And that looks recent as well. Uh, doesn't look great, but it looks done at least. So I'm guessing the guy that I got this off has already attempted this and failed. So well, it looks like we definitely have some more troubleshooting to do. Um, but I am ugh, just, it's filthy. Look at that, that rust around the board here. And yeah, the bottom is just terrible. So I'm going to take this, give it a good hit with some uh, PCB cleaning fluid which will get rid of all of this scunge safely and some distilled water and then a nice alcohol bath to press all the water out so that we can get rid of all this rust and corrosion and good clean slate to start with. Ugh. Okay, just got handheld for a second. Just wanted to show the cleaning product that I'm using, which is this ChemTools Printed Circuit Board and Electronics Parts Cleaning Solution. Uh, and that's just in a little bucket with some pretty hot water. Uh, just hot enough that it's um, kind of scalding. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll just put some of this in there, dunk the board, give it a brush. I've got a uh, paintbrush that I use for this purpose that... Uh, should get us pretty good results. Right, so board is cleaned. Uh, while I had it apart, I took the liberty of recapping it because, uh, well, I didn't really have any particular reason. There was no evidence of leaky caps or damage. None of them were burst or anything. Um, but I mean, just based on, you know, the state code of 83 is 83, small 83. Uh, this board and the components on it are coming up on 40 years old now. So I just, yeah, I prefer to. It's an easy win. I had everything in stock already, so it was no uh, big deal. And the other thing I did was I pulled the cartridge apart, gave it a good clean, made sure the contacts were absolutely pristine, which they are now. Um, and I also checked the EEPROM on there. So I desoldered the, well, not EEPROM, I desoldered the mask ROM that was on there, which should have had championship bar, um, boxing on there. And I couldn't actually read it in my uh, EEPROM programmer. So I got this W. 27C512 and added a copy of Choplifter on there and put it back in. So yeah, that's the cartridge is working. Uh, we've got power, we've got a recap, the board is nice and clean now. I don't feel disgusting touching it. Let's get into it. Um, oh, I've also got my oscilloscope out because I have a feeling that I'm going to be using it here. What I want to do next is actually just verify that the signals from the ROM are actually getting to the CPU. So what I'll do with that is probably just measure from the actual pins on the, the EEPROM here to the data and address lines uh, on the CPU. And I can do that because of the schematic. So this is courtesy of the personal computer SC3000 service manual, because this computer comes from a period where service manual, well, first of all, service manuals were released and second of all, they actually came with full schematics. So this is the CPU up here. Um, and we can see the data lines, so D0 through D7, and then A0 through A15 are there. And if you trace the, let me get some tweezers or something, if we trace the address lines here, so this bus goes down here, goes across here, goes down here, and then this is the cartridge connector. So that is D0 through D7 on pins A15, uh, A22. And then the slight same likewise, so we've got A0 through to A13, uh, A1 through A14 on the on the uh, cartridge connector, and then can trace that bus up, and that goes straight into the uh, CPU. So they're actually a direct connection between the cartridge and the CPU. So what, what I'm going to do first of all is just get my continuity tester out, just probe those pins, and verify that they're actually connected on the thing. Now I could test on the the pins here, but I actually want to test on the EEPROM itself. So if you look at this connector, you can actually see that the pins are actually just directly wired to the back here. 
So what I can do there is also just check with a handy pinout of the EEPROM which pin it actually connects to uh, on the uh, Z80 here. So I'll put my meter into continuity mode, get it in beep a deep mode. So let's get testing. We want D0, which would be pin 14. So this is a 40 pin, so we go from 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14. And then on the 27512, D0 is pin 11. So that's 14, 13, 11, uh, 12, 11. And there's our connectivity. So that's working good. So then we can go to D1, which should be 15, and that should be pin 12 here. Yep. 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 Okay, so that's our, um, yeah, so the digital lines, the, the, uh, the data lines, I should say. Yep. Um, from the CPU to the EEPROM work fine. So be, I'll just beep out the uh, address lines as well so we can see that the data is coming back. Um, and then we'll go from there. So. Okay, so A15 doesn't seem to be working. Okay. No, okay. So we're not getting a connection on A15. I'm not sure that matters, but let's double check. Uh, no, yeah, it doesn't matter. So A13 is the top, the highest pin that we actually connect, get a connection to there. I oh know, oh, there it is, A15. Okay, so A14 and 15 are on the other side. But they definitely should be connected. Okay, so let's try and figure out why that's not there. Hmm. So A15 is the top pin right there. Looks like it goes to, to a VR, which traces up to just underneath there. And then if we look on the back there, that goes straight to the ground. So if we plug that back in, and check our A15 on the EEPROM. This should actually go to not ground. Well, it is kind of going to ground, but it's going to ground through 129 ohms. So there must be a, uh, yeah, so there's our ground. Oh, actually that's not ground, that is five volts. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, so this is B1 and B2 and B1 and B2 are five volts. Yep, yeah. okay. So it's being, so A15 on this is being pulled high which is fine, just because A15 isn't connected, it's obviously not used in this size EEPROM um, for this board, which, yeah, no big deal. Possibly what we want to do now is, uh, this is where I would probably want to look at my scope. And just actually, let's get that booted up. Um, what I'd like to do is actually just see what happens on someone, maybe like D0 or A0 uh, during the boot up sequence. So you should see D0 flapping about as the CPU is requesting, uh, as it's trying to uh, uh, run through its address lines and get data from the, the EEPROM. And then we should also see the EEPROM returning data on the address lines and the address lines should be bouncing up and down as well. Let's grab a single shot. Actually, no, let's just run it and we'll see what happens when we power up. Okay. That's interesting. So it did a big jump and then it settled just constant. Let's turn that off. Let's grab it in single mode. Uh, our trigger is 800 millivolts, so it should be fine. So let's hit go. And there's our shoot up. So we're looking at five milliseconds here, which is actually a pretty long time, but that, so look, it's shooting up to, so we've got two volts per division here. So that's two, that's four, and that's five-ish. But then it's kind of badgering all over the place. Uh, let's get our scale uh, to 10 milliseconds. Let's run it again. Do another single. We'll cycle the power here. Wow, 10 milliseconds it's staying up for. Hmm. 
Let's get an even bigger scale, 20 milliseconds then. Okay, there we go. So now we see what's happening. Kind of. And we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninety, what's that? Ninety like four milliseconds. And then it drops. But it's dropping to, is that like 1.7 volts or so? <sighs> and then it seems to be holding at that value. So if we go back to just running and look at the value right now. Yeah, so it's at yeah, 1.7-ish volts. And it's just staying there. So something in this must be running for a while. 90 odd milliseconds and then something triggers possibly one of the RAM or the um, the other ICs turn on at that point everything gets pulled down but why I don't know, understand why it would be pulled down pulled down to uh, 1 point something volts especially because none of these chips are getting particularly hot so what I'm going to do is check the address line, see if the actual EEPROM is responding and giving output. Uh, so we're looking for A0, which is on pin 30. So it's 21, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, pin 30 there. Let's see. A whole lot of nothing. Oh, I guess it could be 0. So, uh, And it's not changing. So it's not bouncing around. Yeah, no, okay, that 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 could be entirely valid. Uh, we'd have to check some of the other address lines. So let's go 31. Run. No. B2. No. Hmm. Yeah, nothing's changed. Oh, there we go. So that one's up 1. 2-ish volts as well. And same with that one. Right, okay, so... Something's pulling those address and data lines down. Um, but, 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 let's have a look. <clears throat> I'll probably put this up in a graphic and trace it through, but I'm just looking at the data sheet, uh, the schematic now. So, tracing those data lines, it looks like they... Yeah, the address bus and the data bus goes off to all of the different ships. Uh, and it looks like it's affecting both the address and the data bus, because those pins that I last probed were also at 1.2 volts, but they were on the address line. So... This is this MyTech 2 gate array. It's a custom gate array, but it only has a handful of address lines and none of the data lines. This is the SRAM, so that's the work RAM, this uh, 4216. It has both the address and the data, so that's a candidate. Uh, SGC, oh this is the 74, uh, sorry, SN76489AN, so that's this guy, it's the little sound generation chip. Uh, it has the address line, uh, sorry, the data lines, but no address lines. The PPI, 8255A, that's our input ad output. So it has all the data lines and just a handful of address lines. Uh, but those address lines weren't the ones that we were seeing 1.2 volts on. So I'm going to rule that out. There's our CPU. And then the TMS9929ANL, that's our graphics chip. Uh, it has the data lines as well. And no address lines. The only thing on the buses that's connected to both buses would be this SRAM. So let's take a look at that. Um, okay, what I'm going to do, I might get another probe. So I've got my blue probe.
So what I'm going to do, so I should explain this, it's in my head, but yeah. Uh, what I'm going to do is check the, I'm going to trigger on the D, D0 pin that is, I traced it out to this little jumper wire here. So the yellow is uh, triggering on D0. So when D0, the slope goes up above our trigger, which is 800 millivolts there, it should uh, give us a output on the scope. And then what I'm going to do is looking at the SRAM here, I want to pick up the, probably the chip select, I guess. So that is CS on the SRAM here. That looks like pin 18. So this is a 24. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Yep, 24. So 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So that guy right there. And what I want to do, just ground off here again, is basically I'm just looking. I want to see what happens uh, pretty much when in the data the data stream uh, the SRAM is selected. Because if I have this right, and it is the SRAM, when the SRAM becomes active, that's when it's being that's when it's pulling those address and data lines down. So there, that would indicate that the SRAM here is faulty. So there we go. Oh, look at how perfect that is. And by perfect, I mean annoying CS. Yes. Yeah, so you can tell by the select line there, that's the line above it. That means it's active low. So when that is driven high, the SRAM is disabled. So if we look at the data here, as soon as the system powers on and we get that data line coming out, the chip select on the SRAM is also driven high, which means it's inactive. And then as soon as it's driven low, so it comes back to ground here, that's when the voltage on the data lines here gets kind of shunted to 1.2 volts. So I think this SRAM is bad. Um, yeah, okay. So I do believe I have some replacements. These were chips that I recently salvaged uh, from other machines. This is, uh, yeah, there we go. So I've got a 6116 and another 6116 up here. And this is a 4216, but I think this one's probably good to go because it's the right speed, even though like 15 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds, uh, well, it's 150 or 200 here, but uh, it should be fine. This one's 300, so it's a little bit slower, but uh, they should both suffice in this. What I want to do though, is I'll just double check the pinout of both of these and make sure that they're good to go. And if they are, I will desolder that, pop a socket in and pop one of these two replacements in and um, see how that goes. It's just not my day. Time to restock. Uh, what I might do is just use a 28 way uh, and just cut off a couple of pins on the back end there. Uh, it's not the best solution, but it'll do for now. And there's heaps of space here, so I'll just uh, I'll pop it there. And yeah, just uh, snip off. You probably can just extract the pins from the uh, the bottom here. If I use my pin extractor tool here, I should just be able to push them out like so. And then we'll have a 24 pin socket. Yeah, you get the drift. Okay, so we've got our socket. Uh, it's all nicely soldered up and we've cleaned off the uh, flux residue. Looks good. Moment of truth. Um, here we are. There's our original that we pulled out. Matsushita MN4216. And here is what I'm proposing to replace it with, the Hyundai 
HY6116 AP. Uh, yep, verify that they are effectively the same. So this should be a drop in. We've got our notch at the bottom. Pop that in like so. And then, okay, moment of truth. Make sure my speakers are on too. <sighs> same thing. Damn. Well, hmm. <laughs> and I'm speechless. Um, okay. What happens to that data line with the SRM out? So let's pop that there. Grab our probe, back out, ground it off the heat sink again. Uh, there's our data line. So no SRAM this time, we'll see what happens. Okay, so it's still, oh, let's turn our speakers off. It's still bouncing up to the 1.2, so let's grab a single shot again. Oops, I wasn't recording. So. Grab. There we go. Okay, let's grab our single shot. And. Right. Still doing the same thing. Interesting. Well, the only other thing on that entire bus is the CPU. So. Maybe the Z80 is bad. Hmm. I do also actually have a Z80. Um, and funnily enough, from that same salvage that I got these um, uh, memory chips from, I salvaged a Z80 and I wanted to test it. So I breadboard it up. This is going to sound very contrived, but last week I actually breadboarded up uh, a Zilog uh, Z80 tester. So you give this 5 volts and it just runs, it's a no-op tester, so it runs through the address lines and outputs, just lights up the LEDs. And this actually works really well. Um, so as soon as I pull the chip out of reset, the clock starts kicking up and it just counts in binary. And this is just the address lines going one over the other doing a no-op. So yeah, I, um, I put this together because I needed to test one of the Z80s that I salvaged and looks like now I might want to test another one. So let's do the same thing. I'll yank that bad boy out. Let's actually put the original RAM back in here in this oversized socket. Uh, pull that out and see if that's faulty also. I hope it's not, but uh, like I said, I've got a replacement. Let's get to it. So, got the Z80, uh, the D780C out of the board, new socket is soldered in, and just before I uh, popped the new CPU in here, well, new, uh, I just wanted to pop this in my tester and um, verify if we actually get anything. So, got the power in, let's turn it on. So we've got USB power now. 
And let's pull the reset line and nothing. So yeah, that's a pretty solid indictment that this CPU is a bad. Absolutely nothing happens when we reset the CPU over and over and over. Okay then. Good, well, good sign that uh, we're on the right track now. Um, okay, got our Zilog Z80. Let's pop that into the new socket. We've got our old SRAM installed in the SRAM socket here, the oversized socket. Uh, we're recording. I'm the truth, let's try it out. Oh! Hey! Chop lifter! Do we have sound? Ah. Oh, that is fantastic. So the CPU is busted. There you go. Look at that. Oh, I am so <laughs> freaking so excited about that. Oh, that is so cool. I don't even have a joystick connected or a keyboard or anything in which to play this, but that is amazing. Um, I, yeah. CPU. Ah, oh, I, yeah, I don't even have words for how happy I am about this. Um, okay, so let's, I'm going to button this up and put it back together and probably play some games because, yeah, this is fantastic. So I was about to put it all back together. I figured I would try the championship boxing ROM back in the cart, put that back together, plugged it in, turned it on and well I'll turn it on here and this is what we see. So the game starts, it for some reason immediately selects a level even though there's no inputs connected and then uh, well it just continues the game but not actually allowing any inputs whatsoever. Uh, I've tried both with the keyboard and I've tried both on the joystick uh, with just an Atari joystick and nothing. So, there is still something wrong with this system, um, and it has to do with inputs. So the sound is great now, which is excellent, that little chip's going hardcore. Um, the CPU seems to be happy, the RAM, SRAM seems to be happy, the video looks pretty damn good for, you know, 83 composite. Uh, but yeah, so now what we're looking at is the PPI, which is the uh, peripheral, per peripheral, Peripheral Programming Interface, I think. Uh, I think that's what it stands for. It is my stack of data sheets for this system. This is my programmable peripheral interface. So that is the NEC PD825AA. Oh, A. C. Um, yeah, so. <sighs> Something's wrong. Let's figure it out. Um, okay, so what it looks like, it looks like the CPU is interpreting that a button is constantly being pressed. Um, based on the, well, let's restart it. What you'll see, just check out this initial screen here. It says select a level and then it immediately selects. So that makes me think that a fire um, button is being constantly pressed. Or the, not the fire, but start, effectively. So, I've got my scope here. Um, and what I'm going to do is just start probing stuff, I guess. Um, let's have a look at the data sheet again. Um, so here's our PPI 8255. And it is connected, so we've got joystick 1, joystick 2, and the two keyboard matrix bezos here. So uh, joystick 1 is x 0 through 4 and 5 and then he uses y 7 for something and then joystick 2 is x 6, 7, 8, 9 through 10, 11 and also uses y 0. So that's just an Atari, yeah okay, so that's just an Atari pinout. Um, that will be up, down, left, right. Uh, that'll be a paddle. That'll be our fire. 
I don't remember what seven is. Eight is our, oh no, seven would be our five volt. Eight would be our ground. And then I think nine would be a different paddle, like the right. Yeah, I think so. Cause the, I know the joysticks for this SC3000 had two buttons, a left and a right trigger. So I think the X4 would be the, probably the left trigger and an, uh, X5 or pin nine there would be the right trigger. So what I'm guessing it's doing is Y7 uh, in the PPI here. Y7 comes through a decoder, 74LS145. I did print out the data sheet for that. What is that? So yes, that's a decimal decoder. So that's got a truth table and outputs a low when so it's got four inputs and then based on the inputs it just outputs a low uh, on that line and everything else is always going to be high. So I'm guessing when the CPU wants to read the inputs it will pulse through these three lines because it's only using three of them. The fourth is not connected there. Pulse through those three lines on ABC and it's not using D and then that will basically um, sync one of these pins to ground uh, and then it will be able to see if any of these X lines on the other side of the matrix are being pulled low. And yeah, you can see here on the other, on, when it's just before it's connected, they actually have a resi two resistor arrays pulling those X lines uh, 4.7K up to five volts. So yeah, they'll be pulled high and then they'll be sync the they'll they'll be yeah synced down to ground through this thingy i think anyway that, that's a working theory regardless but yeah so they're not actually getting five volts but instead uh they're just being pulled to ground through that y7 pin so we should be seeing uh y7 as ground and then theoretically one of these other pins would be ground as well and that will be triggering it. It could also be in the keyboard, but let's start with joysticks. So let's use this one for now. Um, hmm, where is... Uh, let's go for... So this is our PPI, and where we want uh, pin X. Let's start with X0, so that's... Uh, ooh, one, two, three, four. Those are our up, down, left, right. Well. 4, 3, 2, 1, up, up, down, left, right. So 1, 2, 3, 4, those four pins there is what we're going to want to be looking at. So let's fire it up and see where they are. So we're looking at the yellow line here. So that's high. That's high. That is also high. And that is also high. Hmm. Okay. Well... Maybe we need to... Mm, okay, no, that's fine. Let's see about the other ones. Um, so we're looking at... Uh, four, five, seven. So we want X, six, seven, eight, and nine for joystick two. So X, six, seven, eight, and nine. So that is pins 37 and 38 are X, six, and seven. And then X, eight, and nine are 18 and 19. So we want to look at 30, so it's 49, 48, it was 37 and 38. So this is 37, that's high, and this is 38, that's high as well. Okay, so uh, X8 and 9, these are just the directionals for now. Um, 8 and 9 are 18 and 19, so this is 20, that's 19. And that's 18. Okay, so there's interesting one. So that sh Hmm. That's 2 volts. So sh they should be up here at 5 volts with everything else, but this one is... So that... That's 2 volts. That's kind of... Not right. Uh, so that was pin 18, which is... X8, which would be up, down, left. So that's left on joystick 2. Hmm. Alright, well, let's check the others. So uh, we want to look at 4 and 5 and 10 and 11. So 4 is 
X4 will be pin 40. Um, so, that one. so that's our left fire and that's our right fire. So joystick 1 looks fine. And then joystick 2, 10 and 11 are pins 20 uh -huh, and 21. So yeah, everything except this one. Uh, no, that one, sorry. Which is left on joystick 2. Okay, so let's see. Let's turn this off. Let's see what happens if we pull that. Instead of, let's bypass this resistor array basically and just pull that solidly high. So what I'll do is I'll grab a little... Uh, got to jump a while. Uh, let's pick up 5 volts off the cartridge edge connector here. So these top pins are always 5 volts. And I'll just use a little bit of... Uh, jump a wire here. You know, I broke off uh, one of the capacitors that I replaced. And so it was X, X8, and that's shared by the keyboard connector. So let's jump her off pin 5 here. So this is uh, so X8, and we want to find X8 here. So that's pin 5 on the second keyboard connector, which is. Uh, yeah, CN8, which is this one. So we want to go pin 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Just to double check. Yes, that's also 2 volts. So pin there. If we ram this in there, so that will effectively bypass the uh, 4.7k and give it a better path to 5 volts. And it should actually over, you know, Unless it's a dead short to ground, it should, um, which it's not because we're getting 2 volts through it, it should actually just be 5 volts now instead of 2 volts. And let's see what happens. No, it's still having the same issue. Okay, so let's just check that now. And yeah, we're getting that 5 volts. Okay. So that's weird, but not the issue. Um, let's just put that on the back burner for now. Can I pick up this kit? Okay, so the other one that I want to check was the theory about my about the Y lines here. So, uh, yeah, actually I'll show you because the data sheet actually has the keyboard matrix. So yeah, you've got the, this is the entire keyboard matrix and it's broken up into the Y lines here and then the X lines there. So what it will do, it will pulse this ground and then measure and see if any of these are high or low. And then it'll go to that one and then it'll go to that one and then it'll go to that one and so forth and so on until it figures out which keys are pressed currently. Um, so if all these X lines are 5 volts and all of these Y lines are 5 volts, nothing is pressed. But if Y0 is ground and say uh, X5 is also pulled down to ground by pressing the button, or well, it's connected to that one, not pulled down to ground, but it's connected to that one. That's how it detects or it reads. I'm butchering this explanation, but that's how my brain's working right now. Regardless, um, what we're looking for here is one of these lines. We should be, we should be able to pulse, uh, to measure these lines and see them uh, pulsing to ground as it's measuring effectively or as it's recording. So um, based off the truth table on this guy, because it's got the uh, the three pins coming in, let's go back to the data sheet, uh, the schematic, sorry. Whoa. Yeah, there we are. So based off the three lines coming in, it should uh, decode to this chart here. So A Sorry, D is always going to be low, so we can ignore lines 8 and 9 there. So based on what we see on pins A, B, and C here, we should be able to figure out which of those lines is being pulled down to ground at any point in time. So let's watch those lines and see if they're actually pulsing down. Um, so I don't want to keep throwing that data sheet away. I need to know which pins I'm probing. Um, let's look at... Um, it is literally on the LS chip here, uh, pins 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then pin 9. So that's this fella over here. Let's move our ground reference somewhere else. Uh, let's put it onto this 
joystick lug. Um, so pins, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and nine. So let's get probing. Okay. So pin one is always ground. What the hell? That ain't right. Uh, pin two. Have I got a voltage? Yes, the chip is being powered. Um, this this is wrong. This is busted. Yeah, this is so busted. I mean, you can see in the friggin' data sheet itself, it specifically states that there's no instance where all outputs would be low, ever. And they're all low right now. So... <sighs> yeah, okay. Well, let's check the inputs anyway. So we want to look at those A, B, C lines, which are on pins 13, 14, and 15. Okay, so... That's, yeah, wow. Uh, so, okay, yeah. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So that's 2 volts. 14 is ground, and that's 2 volts as well. Right. And it's not pulsing at all. It's not moving up and down. Yeah, which is... Hmm. And this one's low, so that is our B pin. So B is always grounded, is always low. A is, sorry, this is C, it is 2 volts, and A is 2 volts. Now the question is, is the 7.4 logic chip broken, or is the PPI broken? because one of them is not working right now. I really hope it's the 7.4. Though, well, I'm just, just going to say I really hope it's the 7.4, because 7.4 logic is very easy to find and replace. Um, but this D8255 is a fairly standard for the time uh, peripheral interface chip, so it shouldn't be too hard to get a replacement. All right, I'm going to remove this Let's turn this off. I'm going to remove that 7.4 logic and then we'll test the lines coming out of here and seeing if they're still coming out at 2 volts. Uh, if they are still coming out at 2 volts, that means the PPI is, bust is busted and we'll have to get a replacement. If they're not coming out at 2 volts, it means the 7.4 logic is sinking them to ground internally and it's broken. Um, I might actually be able to test that in my EEPROM program because I know the uh, the TL-866 has uh, 7.4 logic testing. Um, yeah, okay, let's bust out the soldering iron again. Okay, we've got our uh, focus LS seven four LS one four five IC extracted there. So now what we wanted to do was check. I've already forgotten which pin it was. Check the uh, ABC outputs. So PC zero, PC one, PC two, which are fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen on the PPI, and see if they are uh, so. 14 was 2 volts, 15 was ground, and 16 was 2 volts as well. So we want to see if there's any difference there. And that will point to either the PPI or the 7.4 logic as being faulty. So yeah, let's probe pin 14, turn it on and see what we get. So 14. Here goes. Absolutely nothing. So that's ground. Well, that's ground. That's slightly elevated, but 
still kind of at ground. Which is interesting. Okay, let's check the X lines out as well, because they should also right now be uh, pulled up, all of them pulled up. So, am I looking for the Y pins, which are in the first six pins of the first connector and pin 8 on the joysticks. So let's check these uh, seven pins. Powered on. And we've got ground, ground, ground. Yeah, okay. So these should currently be high because... Uh, actually, no. No, that's not true. These should actually be low. No, this is right. So they're not being pulled up by the IC, so yeah, that's that's actually correct. I'm, I'm going down the wrong path there. Uh, but these pins should be doing something, not sitting at ground level, so... I think this is to blame. And also because then this isn't actually running through the cycle, like it should be... Should be being raised up and down by the CPU, possibly the CPU. Wasn't happy either, but hmm. We did see that it was at two volts before, so yeah. I'm not quite sure what. Now I'm going to test this guy, I guess, because that's. So there's either something's wrong in the signaling of this chip and it's not driving those the PC8 uh, one, two, three lines in order to drive the ground lines for the uh, measuring. Or Yeah, so so basically the, the PPI receives there's the uh, eight data lines from the uh, data bus, which is generally signaled by the CPU, and then it has a 0, 1, and chip select, and they will determine what the chip actually does. It's got a read and write buffers, and if we look at the data sheet, I believe it is this one, um, it actually shows that it's got a full uh, programming interface somewhere here. It's this one, yeah, it's got the different modes. So it's basically if a0, yeah, this is in basic operation, uh, if the read line is pulled down to ground and write is high and chip select is also selected by being pulled down to ground, we've got A1 and A0 and they allow three states. So we can either read from port A, port B or port C and vice versa with write being pulled down. We can uh, write f from the data bus into port A, port B, port C, etc. So what I am thinking is happening is that the CPU should be writing to port C in order to pull the uh, the matrix pins down and then reading back what's in A and B, effectively in a loop going through the different values of port C um, in order to read. So it's either the CPU is not doing that operation, uh, which is somewhat harder to check because I need to actually kind of read the data that's coming off the CPU. Um, or the chip itself is bad, and even though it's getting that data, it's not doing anything. So, uh, I mean, we already had an issue with the CPU and we've replaced it. We're getting great graphics, great sound, so I'm less inclined to believe that the data in the CPU isn't reaching the, uh, the PPI. Um, the other alternative is, as well, the... MyTech 2 chip here. This is a custom gate array um, designed by Sega for this system. Uh, it is this I see right there. So it actually is described by Sega in the datasheet here. If we find it. Um, yeah, I'll just. So it's specifically noted it is a custom I see gate array to prevent reset signal chattering from the CPU signal 
uh, and to generate chip select signals of SRAM, SGC and VDP as well as to generate control signals. So one of the other things that this does based off the schematic again is it has the input pins from the CPU for IO request and read and write and then it marks the IO read and write high. So that's what actually tells the PPI when it is wanting to be read, read, read and written to. So it's possible also that this, while the CPU is signaling correctly, that gate array chip is faulty also and it's not sending the right uh, read and write signals. <sighs> well, it'd be the right signal because it's not outputting there. So let's check that as well while we're here. So let me look at that fella. Uh, we want to see pin, looks like 11. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And no, it looks like it's writing, no problem. Yep, it's being signaled down. So that, yeah, that should be fine. And we'll just double check on the uh, uh, PPI here that we're getting that signal. So that's on pin 36. So that's 48, uh, 8, 7, 6. And yeah, we're getting that signal as well. So it's coming from the gate array into the chip and it's actually landing here. And actually what we'll do, because we've got our two signals set up, let's run them both and make sure that we're getting a, so we wanna make sure that we're getting a right enable at the same time that the chip select is low. So that will signal the chip to actually do its business. So let's get our blue line here. Uh, that was 36, right, so six. There that is. And our chip select is on pin six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so they're overlapping. So that's fine. So it is being selected while it's being written to. So, yeah, no. Um, this is telling me that the PPI is busted as well, which is a bummer. Um, I'm going to have to go online and see if I can source a replacement for that because uh, unfortunately <laughs> I got the Z80 and a, and a SRAM chip salvaged, but I don't have one of these. So uh, I'm going to also just double check that this logic, I'm going to punch that into the uh, my apron programmer and see if I can get that tested, but um, I don't think that's faulty just based on what we're seeing here. I think this D8255AC NECIC is also faulty. Um, yep, yeah, I guess I'm gonna have to leave it here for now because I'm gonna have to go online and order another chip. And I guess I'll be back when probably China comes through. Okay. So in uh, XG Pro, I've got the 74145 in my programmer, and I'm just going to go device and logic IC test, uh, auto find, it should find 74445, oh, that's, uh, 74445 is the, uh, it's the same, I think it's the low voltage version. So that's fine, we want to go five volts, the logic, so the truth table looks identical so let's test and yeah it tests fine so every result or res mm, uh, of the test is normal um so yeah that logic chip that kind of backs up what i was showing uh what i was saying earlier the logic chip works fine and the ppi is the one that's faulty so i'm just gonna have to find one online right my life must be scripted because i just Cleaned off my bench, put my Seagar to the side, started going online, and then I thought, hang on, let me just go back through the rejects from the salvage and have a look at any PDIP40s in there, just in case. Are you kidding me? So this is the Oki M82C55A, 
This is the CMOS variant of the 8255A. I obviously discounted that because I didn't think I had a use for it when I went through that bag of chips beforehand, but uh, here we are. So I guess this guy's got a date with a socket and not the gold salvager. So yeah, okay, let's um, put the rest of these back. <laughs> I that salvage has apparently been absolutely fantastic for me. So yep, here we go. No idea what that was pulled off, but I'm glad that I might be able to give it a second life. That's outstanding. All right, so let's get that out of there and another 40 pin, another 40 way socket pops in place. Looks like I need to stock up. And uh, see if this makes a difference. Okay, so we've taken out the NEC D8255AC, popped in a socket, and the salvaged, still can't believe it was in there, M82C55A, the CMOS equivalent of the TTL NEC chip, uh, should be functionally equivalent, but there may be some differences in the voltages um, because the differences between CMOS and TTL, I'm not going to go into that at the moment. Theoretically it should work, but it, it might not just because of, you know, stuff. So let's, let's give some power and see what happens. We've got our cartridge in. Theoretically, if this does work, it should power on and just sit at the start signal, uh, start screen asking me to type, uh, select the type of game. Mm. Oh, gave it power. Nothing's happening. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. We have a new screen. So that's a good sign. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I don't have the keyboard handy. Oh, so it's going into like a demo now. That's awesome. Okay, let's turn that off. And <clears throat> just grab my Tarek joystick that I have handy. And we'll see if it uh, see if it actually works. So this will only give us one of the buttons because this uh, system has two buttons. But uh, well, it might still function. I guess we'll find out in a second. Here we go. Oh, look at that! Oh, I can't believe that's working. Oh, that is so freaking cool! Ding ding! I don't have any clue how to play this game, so I'm just gonna mash until I win. <laughs> I think I need the other button to, to pick my... Uh, Swing type. Oh, I can get a low, low jab though. Get a high jab. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> so I'm gonna call this fixed? Question mark. Um, I mean, I've only got the one cartridge to test with, but it seems to be testing fine. I should probably test it with the keyboard as well. Um, but I don't have any any keyboard programs in which to test with. So I do have, I'm actually I'm really jazzed about this and one of the reasons that I'm extremely jazzed that, I, that this is working even as where it is now, um, 
I might have gotten ahead of myself and prior to getting this working I've uh, been on uh, the Japanese auction website Baiyi and I have ordered uh, a handful of cartridges of different uh, SC1000 uh, SG1000 and SC3000 games um, and including I actually won an option for one of the uh, for a lot that included a basic cart so I am excited that this is going to actually work um, but yeah I'm gonna put this back together and test the keyboard. I do know that you usually can use the arrow keys on the keyboard for games like this, so uh, I'll do that. And yeah, I just, <laughs> this is the Franken. This is going to be like the uh, Shift Theseus with how many chips I'm replacing here. But the one thing that I'm very happy that I haven't had to replace is this, because this Sega MyTech 2 chip is pretty much unobtainium. You cannot find a replacement um, other than finding another um, non-working one of these consoles and they're pretty rare at the moment. Most of them are, are working. Uh, it looks like this chip has a pretty good uh, not failing rate for it, um, but uh, yeah, I'm ecstatic. Replaced ZD80 and replaced PPI or the uh, interface, the IO operation chip thingy and it seems to be working. So it has been about two months since the last bit of this video that I recorded and the slow boat Seamail from Japan has arrived um, and with it the goodies that I received for this SC3000 are a cartridge for the Zaxxon and a load runner and let me just tell you the art on these oh, amazing. You just don't get that anymore. Anyway, the other thing that I got, which I'm really jazzed about, and the entire reason I bought the auction lot, is this. It's my copy of Basic Level 2. Now, unfortunately, it's Level 2, it's not Level 3, with all the extended RAM, but it is Basic nonetheless, and it's a great little box, boxed copy. A uh, little, little bit of damage to the box there, but um, nothing I can't kind of tidy up, but uh, yeah. So I have actually already run these, and they do work really well. Both games play great. Zaxxon struggles on this console. It is not made for it. Uh, but I mean, it still works. So that's that. Load Runner is as good as always. It's just one of my favorite games of all time. I think everyone can agree with that. Um, and the basic does work as well, but it has shown that some of the keyboard doesn't work. So uh, I've already gone ahead and stripped the machine down and pulled the keyboard out. Uh, but what I want to do is just actually take the keyboard apart now and see what we see. So of note, uh, the space wasn't working, this shift wasn't working, uh, actually none of these keys were working. So this shift and enter were both working really well and pretty much all of the regular keys, the arrow keys were working fine. So it's just kind of these around the edge here that I kind of want to get to. And a couple of them you just had to press a little bit hard. And these are a um, graphite uh, strip thing, I don't know the technical term for it, um, but I mean I'm sure that over time a bunch of moisture or dirt or something has gotten in there and just gunked up the contacts, so I'm expecting I'll just pull this apart, give, it a, give them a clean, hopefully I don't need to re-graphite any of those connectors, um, and then we should work. But uh, yeah, for now I have to pull off all these, and I'm just going to use my um, screwdriver for that, so bear with me. That's all of the screws. Moment of truth, and we get to see what this looks like on the underside. Oh. Ah, oh, gross. What are they, mold spores or something? Oh, okay. Oh, it smells just as bad as it looks. Okay, so. Yeah, you can see the carbon contacts under here. They all look pretty much intact. There's no, this one's a little bit worn on the edge. Uh, but in general, they look fine. And the contacts on the keyboard actually look great. Um, it just looks like they're a bit munged up. So I'm curious as to why the space bar wasn't working because that looks fine. Uh, I might just have to give those a good clean. And the space bar is the one that actually has the least damage on it. I'm not quite sure what the purpose of these 
little paper things are, especially because there's, yeah, well, there's none on the spacebar. Uh, well, anyway, um, what I will do is take this somewhere, probably hit it with some vinegar just to kill whatever mold and scungies are in here, uh, give them a full wipe down. I might also re-solder these connectors because they look like they've had some moisture ingress. It's actually kind of backs up what I was thinking originally with this console, which was that it has, uh, yeah, been drowned at some point. And yeah, this would be mold growth from that trapped moisture. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take this and give it a full clean. I'm going to do that off camera because it's just me washing a thing in a sink. Um, and I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, so another thing I wanted to show you were these cables that were connected to the board, and they have just wires uh, both sides. This side was soldered into the keyboard, which is now nice and clean, as you can see, so they stuck through that side. And you may have remembered me bitching about plugging them into the uh, PCB side, and this is my solution. Now, I've done this in the past, and I absolutely love doing it. And what it is, is it's just the wires on the other end of the, the connector trimmed down and then soldered onto a pin header. And this pin header is the right, it's the 2.54mm uh, spacing. Hundred thou? Yeah, 2.54. Anyway, um, and uh, yeah, so what this does, and I've just, uh, yeah, like I said, I just trim down the little wires and just solder straight onto the header. And it's a nice solid connection on all of those pins. And then a little bit of heat shrink over the end, uh, just to hide that wire. And what that does is allows you to get the connector, like so, find the connection, like so. And instead of sitting there fiddling, getting the wires straight and everything, you just pop it in the port and press. And that's in there, nice and solidly. And that goes for both of them. So yeah, quick little hack. So the keyboard matrix panel board, whatever, is nice and clean, much nicer, not scungy to feel anymore. Um, I did the mod to the wires for both of them and sold them back in. I also just resold in this LED because it was a little bit weird. I actually kind of wanted to replace that, but uh, this actually looks like a four mil and I only have three and five mil in stock. So I just went back to the original LED, but yeah, that's fine. I like the green, so that's okay. Um, and you can see that there's still a little bit of pock marks, but um, I did give this a really good soak in vinegar. So whatever mold was growing on here will now be dead and they will just be stains in these little cardboard. Uh, I don't know what these things are for. Um, and I did it mostly without some damage. There's a couple of little bits of the cardboard that tore, but in general it uh, went well and has dried overnight really well. Same as all of the keyboard uh, components. These had mold all spores all throughout, so um, that is in a much better shape now. Not a dot in sight. Uh, and I've cleaned off all of the actual contacts themselves, so they're nice and beautiful. So let's get this back together. And that should go there. And drop straight back into place. And we've got all our screw holes. So I'll just uh, zip this back up and we'll give it a test. Well, here we are. This is, I believe now, uh, the completed project. Um, I got this, just to recap, I got this Seagrass C3000 off a uh, Facebook Marketplace listing. It was not working when I got it. The CPU and the PPI were both faulty and I just lucked out and happened to have, um, happened to recently salvage replacements for those. So they were, they went in nicely. And then just, that was a long, long diagnosis pro uh, process. And I want to thank anyone that's still here watching this video for sticking with it. Um, and I hope you thoroughly enjoyed it, but now got the keyboard and everything back together. I've got my new basic, well, new to me, basic card in. So let's flick this on and verify that everything's working well. And we get to see what basic looks like, which is kind of cool. So we've got this pretty green screen, 515 bytes free. So let's uh, type in a really basic program. So there's the space working, which is nice. Print. Yeah, this shift wasn't working, but this one was. But now if we do that, we get it working. Hello world. And then of course 20, 
go to 10. And I'm not putting much pressure on this, so this keyboard is in peak shape now. And then let's have a list. There's our program, and we can even do, so this key up here has run, so if we do function, and that runs. So that, yeah, perfect. I couldn't be happier, let's try break. Yeah, break worked. Let's just run through them. This key doesn't have a regular function, but if we shift, we get the little pie, so that key is working. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everything's working well, the arrow keys, yep. Just delete, yep. Home, perfect, clear. We get that one, whatever that does, and, and, and D is, I don't know, uh, graph. That one uh, activates the little graphing functions of all these keys. It's kind of cool. We've got control, which does something as well. Functions, ah, just, yeah. I'm really happy with this. Let's see if the reset works as well. Yeah. So the whole keyboard's working great. Um, let's try, let's see if we can throw in our, uh, this is Zaxxon. Yeah. So with Zaxxon, you can use the keyboard here. Uh, this is start and that's fire and then the arrow keys. God, I missed that sound. And there you go, moving around. The arrows are working, we can fire, yep, we can fire. And you can see how slow that background is moving. It's not a particularly powerful processor in this. significantly better. Oh no! Ah, oh, too fast. Oh well. Anyway, this is working excellently. I couldn't be happier. Uh, to have one of these added to my collection with a few awesome games and uh, basic cart. Um, and yeah, I'll be looking at uh, what other software I can get for this in the near future. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me through a very long video, and uh, see you next time.